What just happened? No, it's 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 gonna go on my phone. I'm just trying to put Zoom back on. Ready? We're on. Yeah. Kinder, shall we can resume? Yes. I was gonna start teaching, and they said that I have to wait for you. You see, I'm good friends. <laughs> okay, shall we? So let's learn. Let's learn the mind. Let's not drag our feet too much. So we're on page 103. This is the text, page 103. I'm starting at the top of the page. Second line, I knew this means. Sha'oimeloi that Amalek says, Shagam hu maskim. Amalek agrees. Al in the Lima da mitzvah. You want to learn Torah, you want to do a mitzvah, that's fine. But appreciate that you're learning Torah and doing mitzvahs is no different than any other culture, than any other form of, of expression or of life or even religion. And therefore you have the following argument. Why are you so excited? Why is it necessary? That the way we serve Hashem, three lines in the top of page 103, is that you're serving Hashem with all of your might. Or in the expression of the Gemara, means every person has a different prospect. Right? Not everybody can achieve the same thing. What's 100% for Reuven, maybe for Shimon, 50%. What's 100% for Shimon, maybe for Levi, 50%. So means each person against his own possibility, against his own prospect, against his own promise. If you're doing the best you could do, that's called Kedeboyelelemevet. So why do you have to do it in an extreme way? And in the maximum possible way, had a four lines into the page, emphasis, mas begam, it would be also enough if you were serving which is measured and limited. And again, I'm going back to the premise. If there is something about Judaism which transcends time, if there's something about Taylor Mitzvah which is connected to God, there's room for that. Amalek's whole business is to create that disconnect. And if you create that disconnect, you know, his argument is don't get so excited, relax, don't get so excited. In general, he complains. Five lines from the top of the page. That the right thing to do is that when you want to deal with a way of life which is not good, you go away from it slowly. You don't radically change. You don't spontaneously become a new person. You do it slowly. Why is there so much passion and why is there so much excitement? And of course, there's a reason why this excitement is necessary. There's a reason why this passion is very, very important. You show this person. The Torah states explicitly. I am eight lines on top of the page now. That a Yid's avoidance Hashem has to be with all one's might. Moreover, when a person serves Hashem, it needs to be the maximum you can do. You see, my mother, is in America how many generations? My mother was born here. My grandmother was born here. My great-grandparents came here as children. My great-great-grandparents were in America. Okay, for many years. My mother says they came in the 1880s. My grandfather told me they came before the, before the First World War. And my mother says it's impossible. They're in this country a very long time, way over 100 years. My ancestry is in America probably 130 years on my mother's side. And they've been from throughout. And it wasn't an easy thing. What was the America of old? What was the Jewish America of the turn of the last century? You know, the, from the 1900s. And then all the way until the Holocaust. And then of course, after the Holocaust, so many of the Europeans came here and they made a, an American revolution. Rebbe, the Friedrich and Rebbe made a revolution. They were Jewish, many of them were from, but there was an attitude. The attitude was Judaism is an inconvenience. They used to say in America, it's hard to be Jewish. 
I, I used to know a fellow on Mitzrayim who didn't speak Yiddish well. So he would say, instead of Esses Schwer zu sein, Esses Schwach zu sein. Now, he didn't speak Yiddish, but I did. Schwach means it's weak to be a Jew. Being Jewish weakens you. American Jews had a need, a very important need, a very deep need. And that was to be American. It was very important for American Jews to be American. And I'm going to be honest, I understand them. You know why? Because the Jews have not been treated with greater kindness by any nation, probably since the destruction of the Second Base of Mikdash, than we've been treated by America. America has been very kind to Jews, very kind. And not to see that and not to acknowledge that and not to celebrate that is just not honest and uh, not genuine. But that doesn't mean that we have to sell our soul to America. We're still Jews. Or to say in different words, even in America, a Jew is an immigrant. Even in America, a Jew is an Ivri. He's a foreigner. But Jews who came to America were so embraced by America that they so embraced America itself that being American was very, very important. Now, if I have to be an American and have to keep Shabbos and kosher and mikvah and film and Jewish education, and so on, it becomes very difficult because the cultures are at odds. The cultures are severely at odds, terribly at odds in so many ways, or in a number of very significant and very, very important ways. And one of them is that America has a dream. I, I, I uh, feel like the American dream is a nightmare. The American dream, to use the Rebbe's cliche, is the goal of every American is not to have a good life, but to have a good and easy life. You retire early, and then you look for what to do. Yeah, and you, this is the American dream. And how many Jews have achieved the American dream? There's so much that you need to do. There's so much that you need to earn to give yourself all this promise, all this prospect, all this possibility, correct? And Shabbos is in the way, and kosher is in the way, and film is in the way, and mix is in the way, and children are in the way, and education is in the way. So the attitude of the American Jew is, I have to be an American. Judaism, yeah, but don't take it that seriously. The attitude toward Judaism in America was meaning to say, I do my Yiddishkeit in the least necessary way. I do it, but don't be extra from. No, no, that's not for me. I can be less from, I can be more from. It's like I can buy a good car, I can buy an old car, right? Why would you buy an old car? You buy a good car. When it comes to Yiddishkeit, the model was buy the old car. Everything in Yiddishkeit was a bidiyevit. It was all done second best. And there's a hete, it's a you're allowed to do it this way. But it wasn't just that they were doing it this way because there was an attitude, there was a culture that Yiddishkeit is not that important. It's important, but being American is more important. And we lost millions of Jews, millions of generations because of this philosophy, because of this shita, that Abayim came to this country and they made it one of their core priorities that everything you do as a Jew has to be a Cadillac. Or I don't know what cars they're driving today, Porsche, a Lamborghini, a Rolls Royce. It has to be the best. The film, the best film. Your car can be scratched. It's a change of attitude. What stands between the old American attitude and the new American attitude is Amalek. Amalek says, don't get so excited. You'll do the mitzvah. You'll keep kosher. It has to be glad. Stam kosher is not enough. Bidafka glad. Has to be dafka cholov yisrael. Cholov stam is not enough. Has to be dafka bishel yisrael. You know, otherwise it's not kosher. Afias yisrael. Afia pas palter is not enough. And in everything it was that way. Why the excitement? And of course, the answer is because what America stands for is here today and gone tomorrow. And what Torah and Yiddishkeit stands for is eternal. And the eternity, the truth of it, makes us passionate. And Amalek is saying, there is no truth. So what's the passion? Let's read, okay? If you're looking inside, it's the first word that I circled. It's about nine lines down. He begins to put in uncertainly doubt. The Zerahu and Yonish al Amalek. That's the second thing about Amalek. Amalek of Gematri Yisofik. If the first thing about Amalek is Asher Korcha, that everything is coincidental. 
There's no Hashgacha Pratis. Let's din for Everything is a mistake. His second idea is uncertainty. To be not sure. Is that, you know, in America, there's a class of people called agnostics, with an A, agnostics, right? Agnostics, I guess you could say, are <laughs> intelligent atheists. Atheism is as much a religion as anything else. Atheism is very simplistic. But agnosticism is intelligent. And what does agnosticism say? I'm not sure. That's all it says. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. A Amalek is an agnostic. How do you know? A Jew is a believer, not an agnostic. A Jew can be very, very intelligent, but he's a believer. And all a Amalek, a Amalek says there isn't, doesn't say there isn't a God. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Let's read it inside. Umatil Bazek he throws various uncertainties into this. The me yeme shab shatu kach. How do you know this what this means? Umi yeme shagavane love. Who says this means you? Umi yeme shakavon he gam the maimed the mazash life. Who says it means you as you are right now? And the whole business of Amalek says, maybe it's I told you the story last week. This is a story that hurt my father as a child. My father's told me the story numerous times, and it's a story which not only is compelling to my father, it's compelling to me that my father was a little kid who came from Russia. And you understand yourself when a Jew came from Russia, you know what, the heathen Russia. The Messias Nefesh, they had to be Jewish. My grandfather, all of Trump, whom I knew, the, the risks he took to raise Jewish children, and he was alone, he had no wife. His wife died, my father doesn't remember his own mother, were unbelievable. Unbelievable, unbelievable. He raised three children all by himself. And he came out of Russia. And the only thing that there was, was God and Rebbe. Their whole world was fire. They spent years in France. There was a yeshiva in France. In those times, the yeshiva in France was on an incredibly high level. You could say that the yeshiva in France after the war was on the level of the yeshivas before the war. That's how high level the learning was. My father was 12. He was learning about it by himself, sitting in a basement all day long, not thinking about playing ball. Not he wasn't playing ball. It didn't cross his mind. He was a 12-year-old. This was the culture. This was the world. Then he came to America. And the Hayah sent him to Philadelphia. In other words, the community of Jews in Philadelphia sponsored my grandparents, Aleya Mashalam, and my father, and my uncle, and my aunt, which all lived me well. But if they sponsored you, you had to live in Philadelphia. In other words, when you came to this country as an immigrant, the community that sponsored you hosted you. You had to live in Philadelphia until you were able to make your own way. You understand? When you're able to support yourself, then you could leave. So it probably took my grandparents 10 years to move to New York. My, my uncle and aunt went to learn in yeshiva. My father spent some time at home. For whatever reasons, it doesn't matter the details. But the bottom line is this. There was a shliach in Philadelphia. You're talking 1953, 54. That means 70 years ago. My father told me, that when he was a kid, he went into one of these old shuls, they used to call them museums or morgues, big, gorgeous buildings with no people in them. So in the early 1950s, a man said to my father, that means 70 years ago, a man said to my father, 50 years ago, the entire Mizrach used to stand the whole day and Chabad, Davin Long, Chabad, you know, the long davening of the old Chabad Chosset. In other words, a year told my father that 120 years ago in Philadelphia, there were dozens or hundreds of Jews who davened bariches. Long. There's nothing left of those Jews. Nothing. 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 Why? Because they didn't know what to do with their children. They didn't know what to do with their children. And they, they appreciated the American dream so much that when they watched the Yiddishkeit wane and dissipate and disappear, it was acceptable because of the American dream that they were achieving. A lot of these Jews became excessively wealthy, very, very rich people, incredibly rich. And they gave enormous amounts of tzedakah, copious amounts of tzedakah. I remember that I was saying once at a Fabregen, it's also one of those moments that I never forget. This is a direct quote that Abish that Geschicht Yidden came America is on Poshet Machan Asach Gelt. God Almighty sent Jews to America to simply make a lot of money. American Jews saved the Jewish world. The state of Israel is built with American money. 
All the survivors that came out of the Holocaust were saved with American money. And you can't deny that. And they were not from, they were not religious people. They were Jewish people. But they never lost their souls. They lost their, they lost their Amuna, they lost their Torah, they lost their mitzvahs, they lost their Ebishter. Because of Asher Korcha, the test of being American. So along comes the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and he wants to fight against this trend. Along comes the Lubavitcher Rebbe, a 60-year-old man who is a cripple, and he barely can speak, he can't walk and he can't talk, and he comes to this country determined to push back on the Asher Korcha, to push back on the idea that you're first an American and then a Jew. Because an American is a, ultimately a temporary state and a Jew is an eternal state. And how did he do it? How did he do it? He focused on the children. That's how it's always been done. He focused on the children. So he made all kinds of programs, including programs for kids who were learning in public school, that at least Shabbos, they should come to a Masiba Shabbos and learn something about the Eivishter, that they should have release time instruction, that they should have Talmud Torah classes, Give them a taste of Yiddishkeit, even though they're living in the, in the great America. So Rab the Shliach in Philadelphia was a Jew, but then Rabbi Popak, Rabbi Popak, unfortunately, he passed away young. He, he passed away in the mid-70s, probably, late 70s. He was a Shliach of the Rebbe from 1948 to 49, whenever it was. He moved to Philadelphia. He was the Rebbe Shliach. And uh, one of the Republic had a school, he built a school. But one of the things Rabbi Popak did was he did Mesibah Shabbos. Mesibah Shabbos meant Jewish children who went to public school. But you have to understand, 70 years ago, a Jewish child who went to public school was a lot more Jewish than a Jewish child today going to public school because they were so much closer to the tradition. They spoke Yiddish at home, you know what I'm saying? They spoke with their hands. They were, Jew they, they were, they were so much more close to a time. Their ancestors, their grandparents were from. Now it's the grandparents of the grandparents. So they would invite these kids to come to Mesib Shabbat and they would make these programs in various shuls. And Rabbi Popak came to my 15-year-old father, Zolzangizond, with papers that go to all of the shuls, put them down, announcing that there's going to be a Mesib Shabbos, inviting the children to join. So my father, a young Lubavitcher boy from Russia, who could do nothing more important than give the do something for the Rebbe. You know, it wasn't even called Ufaratzta then, but the idea of Ufaratzta. Save a Jewish child. Don't let the American dream turn into a Jewish nightmare. Ran from shul to shul handing out these papers. Comes into a shul, there's an old man, a 70-year-old Yiddel. The grace of board. Al to Chabad Chosid. Yingele was tells to the little boy, what are you handing out? My father wasn't a little boy, he was 15. Young man, what are you handing out? So he shows it very proudly, a piece of paper, an advertisement for him to see Shabbos. He looks at it very carefully. He reads it like it's a toys fist. You understand the fine print. And he looks at my father and he says with the old, the old Russian cynicism, love Dafka, but Daf does tell it. I'm not sure this is such a good idea. I'm not sure this is such a good idea. Really, you have a better idea. You're 70 years old. You've been living in the country 50 years. Where are your children? Where are your grandchildren? What do you mean you're not sure? You got a better idea? That's a Molik. That's it. That's the Gansa Maise. He was an old man who probably did not have from grandchildren. He may not even have from children, but he was stuck in the past. He couldn't understand the value of gathering a public school child in the Shabbos afternoon and making him make a brocha. He didn't have a better solution. He didn't have a solution. So he, he reigned on my father's parade. My father has never forgotten it. The story happened to my father about 68 years ago, 67 years ago, a very long time ago. At a time, my father was very sincere and very impressionable. And this was one of his Shalom Aleichem's to America. Everything is not important. You understand? That's Hamalik. Who says it means you? Who says it means now? Who says it means a different? I'm going to continue to read, yes? I'm on the first paragraph of page 103. I'm eight lines from the end. He tries to, to wear you out, to take away all of your enthusiasm. That's written in the Gemara. This is the technique. This is the tactic. These are the tools of the Yetzirah. 
Today he tells you to do this. Tomorrow he tells you to do this. Until he tells you, go and worship idols. There's so many different interpretations of this Gemara. It's a heart that comes to you and says, do, don't do an Aveda, but enjoy your lunch. Why shouldn't you enjoy your lunch? Luther, you enjoy your lunch. And the next week he says, enjoy your lunch a little bit more and don't have so much time to bench properly. And he slowly takes away the Ikir, which is the service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, our definition as human beings, as Jewish people, who, in other words, who exercise our freedom to do the right thing rather than the expedient thing, and he replaces it with nonsense. The Fidik Rebbe, this Maimonim, gives a very interesting touch. Kachim Nosa Sheyetzara, this is the Knit Yetzara, Hayem Emele, I say Kach. He sees you doing a mitzvah. He sees you studying this. Good, do that. Do it. Get pleasure from it. <laughs> Develop an ego from it. But do it for you, <laughs> not for the Abishta. And then the next is good, good. It's good that you're being righteous and from and all the rest, but it's for you. And that leads to Aveda Veda Zara. It's not about God. If it's not about God, God dies. And ultimately, the Taylor Mitzvahs die with it. This is all Amalek. Let's read on. Uklipas Amalek Bedakas Yeser Hu. And the, the, the clip of Amalek, Amalek's tendency towards arguing that everything is random. And everything is in doubt. Nothing is for sure. Is such you have an opportunity and different obligation to help another Jew. Along comes Amalek, because he puts uncertainty into it. He argues. You're busy with bigger and better things. And this particular thing, if you won't do it, you have to spend your time getting on the floor. I, I was reading the Maimon. I read it last week when I was half delirious. I read it again this morning when I was preparing. And I'm remembering, I knew a Jew whose name was Abraham Levitansky. He was a tzaddik ayid. He was a big, big tamad chacham, big learned, very learned man. He was a shliach of California for many, many years. Unfortunately, he died young, relatively speaking. And Rabbi Levitansky went on shlichus in the 1960s. And he would meet public school kids and he would see with them all the animals that I eat were to their cud and have split feet. Kosher, kosher, kosher. This great scholar was teaching kids in public school all the animals that I eat. And how 20 or 30 years later, decades later, he got regards from somebody who we taught the kosher song as a child. And I would change their life. But that's what it takes. You go and you find a yidl. And you do what the Yid needs to hear, when he needs to hear it, where he needs to hear it, how he needs to hear it. Even though you're a very important person who could be doing things far more important, this is your mandate. This is your Indian. This is your Shlichas. You understand? Okay. If you don't do it, then somebody else is going to do it that's going to be compromised. You're bigger, busy with, busy with bigger and better things. So we've given Amalek two labels. The first label is Asher Karcha. Everything is an accident. No precision. There's no Ashgacha process. And number two, Asher Karcha, the word Kritos, to cool off, to make uncertain, to make doubt. Okay? And the Rebbe continues. Vihine. Are we with me, girls? I'm reading this middle paragraph here, okay? After Amole gives you his first two dishes, dish number one, everything is temporary, nothing is real. Dish number two, who says it's that important? I have a great counter story. I told you a story about my father, Zalazan Gizunt, where someone says, who says you should have given him out? I got a story to the opposite. Who says? But this I'm going to tell you without a name. A woman told me, she's, she's, uh, she's in her 80s, she's not a young lady. She had a personal relationship with the Rebbe going back to the early 50s. And she hasn't had it easy. Her life has not been easy. Life has been quite difficult, actually. And she lived out of town. Her relationship with the Rebbe was such that when she needed to, she would get on a Greyhound bus. She traveled to New York all by herself, go into the Rebbe and just unload. He was like a father to her. And then he would, she would go back home. Anyway, one of her 
moments, she got into a bus. She was a mother of little kids. She got into a bus, she drove to New York, and she went into the Rebbe. And I don't know exactly what the conversation was, but she didn't come tell the Rebbe, Rebbe, how you doing? And look at beautiful pictures of my kids. There were things on her mind, painful things. And on this one occasion, the Rebbe said to her, quote, Call mother over the Rahman of the Tab of it. Everything God does is for the best. Call mother over the Rahman. Everything Hashem does is for the good. This is what the Rebbe told her. Now I know this woman. She's a Labavish lady. She's not a disrespectful woman. And she's certainly not disrespectful to the Rebbe. She said to me, the words came flying out of my mouth before I could steal my lips shut. She heard herself say to the Rebbe, who says? <laughs> <laughs> she amolek the, the Rebbe. I heard it from her directly. This is not secondhand. I heard it firsthand. She, the Rebbe said to her, you know, she was complaining about her life and she had legitimate complaints. And the Rebbe said to her, everything I have does the best. Yeah, really? Who said? Who said? She says, the Rebbe smiled. Like the Rebbe knows how to smile. The Rebbe smiled could melt ice and said, I say so. That's my opinion. That's the antidote. That's the enemy. That's the antithesis. That's the other side of what Amalek is. So the fashakor chabaderech. He brings a coldness into everything. Let's read it on. See if it says, middle paragraph, page 103. The root of the word vayizanev is zonev, which means a tail. The root of the word nechasholem means cholash, those who are weak. He chops off at the edge of the edge. That's what the words mean, spirit, the spirit of the words. When you want to attack an idea or a group or a philosophy, you find the weakest link. You don't attack the heart. You find the people at the edge. And you try to wear away at them. You try to wear them out. But Yezanev, he cut off the tails of Kol Nechashon, those who were exhausted. V'ha'inyin who this means, the hine. Iker klipas amolek he. When does amolek have power? Kasher hu b'mchinus nechashon machadecha. When somebody is weak and someone is falling out, this is where Amalek lives. It's like a parasite, right? We all are carrying all kinds of parasites and bacteria and viruses in our system, and we're healthy. When do we get sick? If we're tired, we're hungry, we're cold, we're afraid, all of a sudden we get sick. Why did I get sick? Because my energy is depleted. When I'm cold, I have to work extra to keep myself warm. When I'm tired, I have to work extra hard to keep myself awake. When I'm afraid, I have to use extra energy to keep myself focused. And there's not enough energy to fight with the bacteria. So they multiply. It's very simple. No one gets sick from the cold. But when you're cold, you get sick. Right? This is Amalek. He finds the weak and he attacks. And the Rebbe says, the Kashed, who betech on and somebody's inside the clouds, and of course this is a historical reference the Jewish people had clouds that surrounded them and protected them but some Jews fell out of the clouds and if a Jew physically fell out of the cloud it was a reflection of the fact that spiritually they were fallen out of the cloud so if you're inside the cloud can't touch you a Jew is weak and because he's weak, he so to speak fallen out of the cloud. that the person says, his own intelligence, his own opinion. he knows himself. he's self-sustained. He's self a self-contained righteous Jew. and he thinks that his Jewish fortitude, his Jewish success, is his own. And he thinks he doesn't have to be protected. He doesn't need an environment to protect him. In Ezuya, see, but that is the cause, Lazette, to the fact. So this is another factor. Who does Amalek attack? The attackable, the weak. But he's not after the weak. He's after the heart. He's after the heart. But he knows this is the way to the heart. Touch the fingers and toes. You touch the edge, the skin, the hair, the nails, the periphery. And it leads you to the heart. Okay, so now the point that we have to take away from this class is the idea that Amalek doesn't have a reason for his opposition. The reason for his opposition is that he's an opponent. That's it. His whole Matthias is the opposite. Whatever you are, he's against. And it's, a, it's an evil. It's a klipa. It's bad. And you have to fight with Amalek. And you have to defeat Amalek.
Okay? How do you fight with Amalek? If you have an idea, and somebody comes along with another idea, you can argue with them. If you have an emotional attitude, and somebody else has a different emotional attitude, so it becomes a, a debate of whose ideas, whose emotional tendencies are more correct. So you argue it out. Yeah? What about somebody whose entire motivation is, whatever you are, it's no good. I had a grandfather, he's deceased, he's gone. My son, who's almost by mitzvah, is named after him. He, he, it's a long story. Very beautiful person, my ID. But uh, one of the stories in his life was that he started a business and he brought in partners that they didn't like him. The reason they didn't like him was he was too from. This is the 50s. This is going back seven years. When the attitude was, if you can make a better coach, you're a worse coach, why would you try harder? My grandfather was an Adel Hayyid. Whatever he said, they disagreed with. They threw him out of the business. He started the business. Threw him out. I'm not going to go into the details. It's not important. But one of the stories he told me was that it didn't matter what idea he would present. Whatever he said was no good. It just didn't matter. My grandfather had an idea to make a walk-in freezer. And today, everybody has walk-in freezer. It was a new concept. It was brand The technology was brand new. So my grandfather met a person who was doing this work. And he came to his partners. Not ridiculous. A week later, they did it. <laughs> but whatever he said, if he said, no, nah, are you crazy? No, nah, whatever. No, nah, no good. This was the, no, and this is a bowick. Whatever you say is no good. Nah, that's all. How do you fight with that? How do you fight with nah? I was talking to my students in the morning. The worst critic of a from Jew is one who laughs at him. How do you defend against a laugh? You can laugh at anything. You can make fun of anything and anybody. It's really not hard. There's a, there's, a, there's a reason they say that comedians are bitter people. They're certainly sad people, but in many cases, they're bitter people. It's so easy to make fun. It's just so easy. It really is. How do you fight it? You don't fight it with reason. You don't fight it with passion. You don't fight it with sensitivity. You fight it with stubbornness. The only way to defeat a scoffer is with hard neckness. In other words, since he's not approaching you with reason, you can't defend yourself with reason. Since he's not approaching you with emotion or sensitivity, you can't fight with emotion. You have to be tougher than him. Which is why the Chazal say, that the soldiers who went to fight against the war of Amalek are called Anche Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu's people. What makes Moshe special wasn't that he was smart, even though he's the smartest guy who ever lived. What makes Moshe special is not that he was sensitive, is that his connection to Hashem was completely without reason. And if you're going to defeat an enemy of Hashem, who's an enemy of Hashem without reason, you have to have a friend of Hashem who's a friend of Hashem and a level is higher than reason. I will do this next week, Mitzvah Hashem. Okay? So I am apologizing officially because all I did today, literally, all I did today was...